time once again to enter the world of the paranormal. And tonight, I want to tell you about a very strange and as yet unexplained event which happened some six years ago. The story centers around an old mill situated in our region. As usual, because the mill is currently occupied, I'll not tell you exactly where it is, as the present occupants don't wish to be disturbed. The mill itself is over 200 years old. The people concerned in this story bought it in early 1982 when it was derelict. And over the next two years, they spared no expense in restoring it to its former glory. Let me describe it to you. It's a large building built by the side of a now dried up riverbed. On the side is a large water wheel which originally turned the huge grinding stones. Naturally, there used to be a river running in the old days, but as I've said, it's now dried up and has been for over 80 years. All the rooms in the house are large, and the main feature is the actual grinding room itself, which still contains the stones used in the production of flour and has been turned over into a magnificent sitting room. Anyway, the family which restored the mill finally moved in in 1984, and it's no exaggeration to say that they were over the moon with their new home. It had character and history and was considered a showpiece for miles around. They were very happy there and they often held small dinner parties as much as to enjoy their friends' company as to show off their proudest possession, the house. One particular night in late 1984, they were holding one such party. It was a friendly affair and it went on late into the night. The final guests left at around 1 a.m. and the two hosts began to tidy up prior to going to bed. As they were stacking the plates in the dishwasher, the wife heard a noise which seemed to come from the mill room, as they called the room where the stone's in. Thinking that one of their guests might have returned, she went into the room but found nothing. She thought no more about it, and about half an hour later, she and her husband retired to bed. A little after three that morning, she was again woken by strange sounds seeming to come from the mill room. This time, she thought that perhaps they had burglars, so she asked her husband to go downstairs and investigate. He did so, but when he entered the room, he again found nothing. However, he did hear a strange murmuring noise, almost like a low rumble, but he couldn't locate the source, and eventually he put it down to the wind outside and went back to bed. Nothing further happened that night to disturb their sleep, and the next morning they had a good laugh about how a bit of wine can make perfectly natural things seem like something completely different. But that night, again at about 3 a.m., they were woken by the strange murmuring rumbling sound. Again the husband went downstairs to investigate, and again he found nothing, or at least nothing he could see. But the noise was quite a bit louder than it had been the previous night, although he couldn't locate its source. This time, he put it down to movement in the house due to its age, and determined to call in an architect to see if there was anything wrong with the structure. After all, he didn't want it to collapse or anything. Nothing else happened for a day or two, and the architect found nothing wrong with the building. In fact, he said that it was probably stronger now than it was when it was first built 200 years ago. Reassured, the couple dismissed the noises from their minds and got on with the business of living in their dream home. But four nights later, they were once more woken by the strange rumbling noise, only this time it was quite loud, and the floor of their bedroom seemed to be vibrating because of it. Slightly worried, the husband went downstairs, this time followed by his wife. As they entered the mill room, the sight that met their eyes made them stop in amazement. Because although the room was in darkness, the millstones seemed to be glowing with an unearthly light, a pale blue light which didn't cast any shadows. And in the glow from this strange light, they could see what looked like a fine whitish dust swirling in the still air. Immediately, they switched on the light, and as soon as they did so, the rumbling stopped, and the dust became invisible. Disturbed by what they'd seen, the couple returned to bed, but were unable to sleep properly for the rest of the night. 
The next morning, they examined the mill room in minute detail, but could find no explanation for the glow or the fine dust. What was even stranger was the fact that there was no evidence that there had been any dust in the room in the first place. All the furniture surfaces were clean and dust free. There was, however, one lasting effect from the night's events. No matter how much they turned up the central heating or piled logs on the open fire, the mill room wouldn't warm up. It wasn't exactly cold, just chilly enough to be uncomfortable. Again, nothing happened for a week or so. And then one Saturday night, just before Christmas, 1984, their lives were forever changed. As usual, they'd gone to bed at 11 p.m. and were fast asleep when, at precisely 4.45 a.m., they were awoken by loud noises. This time, it was not just the rumbling sound. It was mingled with the sounds of horses snuffling, people talking, and metal on stone. And it seemed to be all over the house. The couple were both terrified, but despite themselves, they went downstairs to the mill room, for that seemed to be the source of the noise. As soon as they entered the room, they were confronted with a scene which defied normal explanation. For it seemed as if they'd been transported back 200 years. And yet, they hadn't. It was like one picture superimposed on another. For although they could still see their furniture and decorations, they could also see the grinding stones in use and several people working. There was a large middle-aged man working at the stones and a younger man was piling up sacks against the far wall. And where the wall of the room should have been, there was a large double door through which they could see an old-fashioned horse-drawn cart and two small children climbing over it. The noise was deafening. The stones made a grating, grinding sound as they turned in opposite directions and there was the sound of rushing water outside. It was as if they were watching the history of the mill being replayed. Fear is not a good enough word to describe their feelings at this moment. The couple turned on their heels and fled the room. They immediately ran upstairs, threw on a few clothes and left the house as fast as they could. Once outside, the first thing they noticed was the water wheel, for many years static and rusted, turning slowly. Without any further ado, they jumped into their car and sped off down the lane. The wife's sister lived only a few miles away and they made for her house. When they arrived and staggered into her house, the husband remembered that he'd not bothered to lock their own home. So he said that he must return just long enough to secure the house from intruders and then he would return immediately. But by 10 o'clock the next morning, he had still not returned and his wife was frantic with worry. She persuaded her brother-in-law to accompany her back to find her husband, and reluctantly, they set off. As they approached the mill house, she was relieved to see that everything seemed to be normal. There was no sign of any carts or turning water wheels or children playing in the front. Her husband's car was parked outside the front door. She ran up to the house and called out for her husband, but there was no reply. She called again, and when her shout was greeted by silence, she feared the worst. Just then, she heard her brother-in-law calling from the side of the house, and she went to investigate. And there, in the dried-up riverbed by the water wheel, was the body of her husband. He was soaking wet, which was odd, as there had been no rain or dampness of any sort. There's a strange postscript to this story. Subsequent research into the history of the mill revealed records which showed that the miller who owned it in 1834 had died when he'd fallen into the stream which drove the water wheel and drowned. And a post-mortem on the husband revealed that he had died from drowning. His lungs were filled with a brackish liquid like stream water. But even stranger, was that embedded below the surface of his skin was a mass of white powder which, when analysed, turned out
to be unrefined flour. 